Hello, Internet. It's always this awkward beginning of these things when nobody's listening and I'm waiting for people to tune in, but I'll just uh, stop waiting and I'll just talk because people will be listening to this after the fact, too, in podcast form. Speaking of which, you can download this in podcast form at uh, soon after it's done at uh, Patreon, at Substack, and also at davidrovics.com slash this week, where you can find various other spoken and sung broadcasts. And um, I have been feeling uh, pretty dejected about uh, genocide and other horrible developments on planet Earth. And... Um, and I know a lot of other people are feeling that way, too. And uh, given that uh, we don't seem to be able to stop it from happening right away, uh, I thought I'd do a broadcast m about rebel songs, R rebel, rebel, about rebellions, about re the resistance. Because I, I, basically I was just thinking this morning as I was planning this broadcast, which was a very uh, unplanned affair um, just because my family was leaving me for the day, and I thought I should do something, so I thought I'll, I'll do a broadcast. And then I thought, well, what I really should do is songs about actual resistance, not just the usual songs that I do about people who died. You know, I often say my my songs have a high death toll, and, um, you know, that's okay. But it's, um, I think, good to actually focus on actual, I mean, it's successful resistance. And I say, I'll, I'll put successful with a little, uh, you know, a little asterisk because um, re rebellions don't usually lead to revolutions. They, uh, but they do usually lead to big changes. And, um, and then, uh, of course, armed rebellions are only one, uh, but one very important way that things have changed um, in history, recent and, and, and further uh, back around the world. But then there's also all sorts of other forms of resistance that have made a real impact on all kinds of different societies, including mass uh, civil disobedience and, um, and even... Um, actions undertaken by small groups of people and even individuals, uh, which have historically uh, actually made a big difference in all kinds of different settings and societies and, and uh, you know, as history unfolded in various different places. So there's your overview for what I'm doing here. I have a, I have a handwritten list of uh, songs, uh, which is all songs about... Uh, on this uh, general subject, and I'll, I'll make them into a playlist of resistance songs on um, SoundCloud eventually. And um, this will probably be one of many uh, similar sessions on this subject because I've actually written a lot of songs about this, although I've never put them together in any form, uh, actually, for some reason. Um, but uh, I will just uh, more or less randomly start. And I can see your comments, by the way. So thanks. I love seeing comments. And, and if there's anything in particular that seems relevant for responding to or putting up on the screen or something, just, uh, you know, I uh, will. And, um, but um, I'll start this uh, little um, first of a, a series of broadcasts about songs related more pretty much directly to resistance of uh, various kinds um, with uh, a little song about uh, 1831 in Wales. Um, the first use of the red flag as a symbol of revolution was uh, apparently uh, in Wales in 1831. And um, this, uh, the Merthyr Tydfil uprising, uh, which was put down by Scottish Highlander troops in true colonial fashion, um, was a, a seminal event, uh, the last armed uprising on the island of Great Britain, and um, it was a uh, an event that uh, that that very much helped uh, sort of midwife the birth of the uh, Welsh, English, and Scottish uh, 
trade union councils, which formed um, three years later and, and made and were basically the, 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 the foundation of what would be eventually become a powerful British labor movement. <laughs> The age of industry begun, for the working folk of Wales life was short. With wages cut again, it was only sensible that then folks took over, shut down the debtor's court. The gentry pulled the wire, told their men to open fire and restore the rule of their estate. But as the night descended, and the battle ended, the soldiers had all fled behind the gate. They chanted cheese and bread, and our children must be fed in the days when Wales rose against the crown. They chanted cheese and bread with a bloody loaf above their heads when the red flag flew in Merthyr Town. The message went out east and west to put the gentry to the test. The cavalry was ambushed and turned back. After so long playing defense, the time had come now when the workers were the ones on the attack. They chanted cheese and bread, and our children must be fed in the days when Wales rose against the crown. They chanted cheese and bread with a bloody loaf above their heads when the red flag flew in Merthyr Town. The crown sent soldiers by the score till order was restored. Then came Dick Pendarren's execution. Another martyr for the cause, meant to give us pause. The next time people call for revolution. They chanted cheese and bread, and our children must be fed in the days when Wales rose against the crown. They chanted cheese and bread with a bloody loaf above their heads when the red flag flew in Merthyr Town. And that is going to be on my upcoming album with the band in France that I was recording with last month. Whenever the album's out, I'm not sure, but that'll be on it. And this next one will be as well. And um, it is a, a decidedly punk rock rendition that you'll be hearing and um in um in the 1840s um well actually you know actually the 1840s has been coming up uh, a lot re recently for history buffs who are fond of making uh comparisons between the present and the past One of those um, comparisons that people have been making have been uh, around uh, other famines that have been imposed by um, outside forces. Um, BBC is actually currently doing, uh, well, one of the strange things about BBC is their historical documentaries can be really good even while their coverage of the current events uh, is more wanting. But um, they're, they, they have an excellent uh, series that they're doing right now called The Three Million about um, the Bengal famine uh, during uh, the Second World War, which was entirely, um, entirely the fault of the British colonial authorities in India. And um, they, uh, the British colonial authorities were directly responsible for other famines, including the famine in Ireland in the 1840s. Although, at least with the famine in Ireland, as well as the hunger that was uh, uh, throughout Europe uh, for, for the working class um, and the peasantry um, in the 1840s, uh, in Ireland it led to famine. And the reason is because of 
British government policies, um, although there was a potato blight throughout Europe, um, and uh, and it was causing all kinds of problems, and it was also leading to all kinds of rebellions, including the rebellions of 1848, which overthrew every um, every monarchy in Europe, with the exceptions of Russia and England. But um, mostly they came back to power, but in a very changed form. Uh, and in the United States, um, there were also rebellions uh, going on that were very much around the same kinds of questions of uh, land and freedom, and um, which is always what it's about. And um, in upstate New York, um, and incidentally, I'm, I'm going to New York um, in, a, in a couple of days. Me and my family on Tuesday head to the Northeast, and, and I'll be doing gigs in uh, Woodstock, New York, and also Boston and Amherst, Massachusetts, and New Haven, Connecticut, and possibly others. And uh, But that, that's what's definite coming up at uh, davidrovix.com slash tour. You can see those details if you're around there or know anybody who is. But anyway, in upstate New York in the 1840s, um, there was a, uh, a when when the rent went up on the tenant farmers and yes most farmers were tenant farmers back then it's a concept that a lot of people aren't even familiar with today thankfully uh, although in much of the world it's very common it's still today and um but the tenant farmers of upstate new york uh had their uh essentially rent went up massively all of a sudden and um and they organized a rent strike and it went on for nine years and it transformed uh the society in all kinds of ways although today um it would be hard to hard to tell uh, but for a while it made a difference led directly to the homestead act which was not good for a lot of people but was good for a lot of others including a lot of working class folks. So this song's called Landlord. The patroons came from Holland to America, became landlords where none had been before. Soon one man owned half a million acres on both sides of the Hudson River shore. He invited families to move in and give him 30% of everything they grew every year this is how they'd pay the rent his name was van rensselaer he became one of the richest men on earth in today's terms 90 billion dollars is how much he'd be worth all this for doing nothing but saying all of this was his I have the power of the state behind me and I'm in the landlord biz after 200 years of this and one revolution won another Van Rensselaer had another son and this Rensselaer was greedier than his ancestors dead and past it was now the 1840s and things were changing fast it was the straw that broke the back the bottle was uncorked they started organizing meetings the tenant farmers of new york they found the strength of numbers they found the power of suggestion they found each other asking the same question who gave you the right to be a landlord to live a life of ease while others toil who gave you the right to be a rich man while the rest of us pay you so we can work this soil they vowed they would stop the rent collection they vowed they'd bring this madness to an end and when one blew the tin horn of distress they soon found they had a thousand friends dressed in calico skirts with masks upon their faces on horseback armed with knives and guns they chanted and they yelled they kept their farms and they kept the sheriffs on the run they asked who gave you the right to be a landlord to live a life of ease while others toil who gave you the right to be a rich man while the rest of us pay you so we can work this soil The 
governor's malicious tried to stop them. But nothing could be done to break their will. And by 1848, the landlords buckled, sold their holdings to the farmers in the hills. Yes, they overthrew this feudal system, but it's replaced now by speculators and banks. And you can still hear the homeless families asking, ah, oh, the landed gentry in our ranks. Who gave you the right to be a landlord, to live a life of ease while others toil? Who gave you the right to be a rich man, while the rest of us pay you so we can work this soil? Who gave you the right to be a landlord, to live a life of ease while others toil? Who gave you the right to be a rich man, while the rest of us pay you so we can work this soil? Who gave you the right? I was um, recently um, hanging out with somebody at a party who um, was uh, friends with the uh, marine toxicologist Nikki, uh, Ricky Ott, who wrote a wonderful book called uh, Not One Drop about the, um, about the um, blockade of Prince William Sound, well, about the Valdez oil spill in the 80s in Alaska, the Exxon Valdez uh, ship uh, that spilled oil. And, uh, and the consequences for, um, For the people and for the fish and the environment and uh, and uh, the um, it was a terrible terrible thing um, this oil spill but the uh, what um, what transpired afterwards um, uh, specifically four years afterwards uh, when the fisher people of uh, Cordova and elsewhere in the region uh, realized that uh, the herring run was not going to be coming back uh, as a result of the uh, oil. Um, they, um, what they, wanted, they wanted justice. They wanted compensation. They wanted uh, a lot more than that. They wanted, uh, they wanted to know uh, why the government didn't seem to have any real data on just how toxic oil was uh, when it was obviously extremely toxic. And uh, as a result of their blockade, the, uh, the U.S. government spent a billion dollars researching the toxicity of oil after that. song called Cordova. I am a fisherman, so were my parents. Here in Cordova, on Prince William Sound, I'm not a tree hugger, but I love the mountains. And hauling in the gill net with the ocean all around, life was good here. You could raise a family with a hundred thousand tons of herring set out every year, 1989. The tanker grounded Nothing's ever been the same around here Senator Stevens said Not one drop Of oil would spill On Alaska's shores And if it happened It would be cleaned up but our beaches were still covered, as was the ocean floor. Four years passed, each run collapsed. It was then we knew for sure the herring weren't coming back. Exxon's promises of compensation were about as empty as a used up paper sack. It was August 20th, 1993, when we fishermen decided 
something must be done. We packed some groceries, we made some banners. We headed out to Valdez Narrows beneath the midnight sun. One hundred vessels took to the water, pushed through a storm and to the Valdez Sea. We lined up our boats, formed a blockade, and we waited for whatever might be. was approaching. It was a sight to see there in the twilight of the day we saw it turning. We all cheered and cried as tanker after tanker after tanker turned away. A Coast Guard gunship from Seattle would take three days to get up to the sound. We held the line till then. Then we went back home to Cordova, to this hallowed oiled ground. I am a fisherman, so were my parents. Here in Cordova, on Prince William Sound. I'll do a song about another sea-related event. Um, this is not so much about a social movement as about um, another action taken not by a small group or a social movement or an individual, but taken by the leader of one of the world's biggest empires at the time. And it's history that is um, very, very, very much uh, goes against every aspect of the Hasbara troll narrative that you can find uh, flooding social media these days. Um, the uh, the narrative that says Muslims are scary and dangerous, and and uh, and you know, um, th there's a sort of a uh, and Christians are a lot friendlier. And uh, the historical reality is completely uh, the opposite of that. Most notably, in 1492, when uh, Spain came under uh, Christian, you know, Catholic rule completely, I think for the first time in 800 years or whatever. And, um, and uh, the... Um, uh, Jews and Muslims were given, uh, I think first the Jews and then the Muslims were given uh, a certain amount of time to leave the country or face horrible consequences like death. And, um, and so uh, the, the Ottoman Navy, the Sultan uh, sent uh, the Ottoman Navy to Spain to rescue the Jews of Spain. Um, 800,000 is the estimate, an estimated number of people. Um, that were rescued. In 1492, Colombo crossed the ocean, only one of many horrors that would then be set in motion. As his men cut limbs of Arawaks, and burn children at the stake. Plundering a continent for God's sake. In 1492, when King Ferdinand won Granada, he passed a law known as the Edict of Alhambra. It was as the landlords wanted, as his gracious God had willed, that any Jew in Spain had three months to leave or else be killed. In 
800,000 Europeans became refugees and headed east across the Mediterranean Sea. In 1492, they were starving and bereft. The king said they'd be safe up until the time they left. But Christian Europeans cut them open with their swords. Search their stomachs for gold and dump them overboard. And 800,000 Europeans became refugees and headed east across the Mediterranean Sea. In 1492, the Sultan sent his fleet to go rescue Sephardim after the Andalus defeat. Hundreds of thousands of people who knew their deaths were near were rescued by Muslims and taken to Izmir. In 1492, the Sultan said that's fine. If they'd impoverish their kingdom just to enrich mine. The Sultan also passed an edict. He said, welcome home. Now treat your new neighbors as if they were your own. And 800,000 Europeans became refugees and headed east across the Mediterranean Sea. And headed east across the Mediterranean Sea. In 1492, And, um, let's do uh, one for, uh, another, um, particular form of, uh, s relatively small groups of people, uh, having a, um, disproportionately large impact, uh, given their numbers. Um, have been uh, events taking place in England and Scotland over the past several years, or three years, I guess, involving the company Elbit Systems and UAV Systems and other related uh, arms manufacturers and weapons manufacturers um, that export largely to the Israeli military, um, which is, of course, actually illegal under British and international law, given that uh, Israel is constantly violating all kinds of uh, laws, uh, international and otherwise, um, that uh, should uh, actually prohibit the export of arms to Israel from Britain. Um, but of course, the British government and the courts uh, tend to look the other way until they're challenged. And then when they are challenged, um, things often don't go uh, Elbit Systems' way. And, and uh, many activist actionists, as they call themselves, have been uh, found uh, innocent of uh, the um, of anything of any wrongdoing, even after causing millions of dollars worth of damage. 
to all sorts of equipment at these factories that they go in smashing their way through. And um, lately there have been some uh, people found guilty and, and, and facing all sorts of prison sentences, and I encourage you to go to palestineaction.org and, and uh, find out what are the court, ca- court cases going on now and who needs support in the course of these uh, prosecutions against uh, Palestine action actionists. Um, I used to see them a lot on Instagram, but apparently Instagram just passed a new uh, a regulation that uh, political content is throttled unless you uh, say somewhere uh, on Instagram that you want uh, political content. Um, so that's really alarming. And... Um, this is a song about events that have been taking place in England and Scotland, and I will just pause momentarily before singing the song to mention to people in England or Scotland or Wales or Ireland that I will be coming back there in March of 2025. I know that's a long way off, but next year, this time, I will be there, and uh, I can. I, I already got a booking in London, and I'm very open to more. Um, and, uh, um, and while we're talking about touring, uh, for those of you who live in the Northeast, in Boston, New York, uh, New Haven, um, I will be there in uh, this coming weekend, uh, leaving in two days with my family to go to the East Coast. I'll be playing in Boston, Amherst, Massachusetts, and in uh, New Haven, Connecticut, and Woodstock, New York, uh, and maybe elsewhere. And, um, and then for those of you in, on the West Coast, I'll be doing gigs in Oregon at the end of May. And um, da- in California in April, I mean in August, uh, t- traveling down the coast in, in August, um, doing gigs uh, at backyard concerts in Northern California. And also, uh, what, did I mention Australia? Australia. Uh, in late June, July, I'll be in Australia playing gigs there. And November, Scandinavia. So if you're from any of those places, I'd love to hear from you about doing gigs because there's loads of room free for gigs in all those areas um, other than the, the Northeast, which is pretty filled up coming up this week. But all those other areas that are further off, I have loads of space for, for more gigs. Um, and I'd love to hear from people about that. So non-commercial announcement over, and I will now do a song up for Palestine action. In tune with the right chords. Protests were going on, they were going on for years. And then Palestine action started smashing up the gears. And that's when the people got up off of their seats, took their families into town and blockaded the streets. For three days and nights, you could hear the hammer swing. Though no one knew for sure what the future might bring They knew one thing for certain These weapons of war Must not be sent to the ports they're heading for So this is a note to Elbit Systems You will be shut down When the sledgehammers of justice come to town After smashing up equipment and smashing a whole bunch A lot of folks began developing a hunch The cops took three full days to send anyone inside And after 15 hours they let the charges slide It seems the prosecutors understood the climb British companies aiding and abetting war crimes The factory in Oldham had to close its gate And the muralists in Palestine said that's smashing great So this is a note to Elbit Systems, you will be shut down When the sledgehammers of justice come to town All around the country hammers being swung Showing civil disobedience is stronger than the tongue Taking action here so the weapons go nowhere So they don't get sent to the IOF cause we know what they'll do there And so does the Prime Minister and the men who he supports Selling weapons to war criminals who don't want to go to court Who don't want to face the facts of what they've done Where the bullets go when they're fired from the guns So this is a note to Elbit Systems You will be shut down When the sledgehammers of justice come to town So this is a note to Elbit Systems You will be shut down 
When the sledgehammers of justice come to town. When the sledgehammers of justice come to town. Unadi cum. Unadi cum. Unadi cum. Unadi cum. There's um, forms of resistance that are extremely um, uh, dangerous and costly and, and, and may or may not work depending on the situation. Um, that probably applies to every different possible form of resistance, in fact. But um, as people are aware who, um, who know anything about recent Palestinian history in the past few years. Uh, you know about the Great March of Return in Gaza and the many, many thousands of people that were involved with peaceful protests every Friday on the wall, on the fence between Gaza and Israel, um, calling for the siege to be lifted and for people to be allowed to eat and drink clean water and repair their homes and other things that they hadn't been able to do for many, many years because of Israel's policies of uh, keeping their walled-off ghetto a walled-off ghetto. And people marched to the border fence there every Friday, and every Friday they were massacred for being there. And um, there are many, many thousands of people in Gaza because of those massacres who survived being shot and, and are now paralyzed or they don't have eyes because the Israeli snipers were aiming for their eyes. But then other times, uh, the same kind of nonviolent, very high stakes kind of tactic of uh, just standing your ground and doing it like that. Um, in other cases, with a less um, fascistic foe than the Israelis, um, it works and um, can change whole societies with this kind of sentiment. And uh, this is a song about what happened on December 21st, 2015 on the Kenya-Somalia border. It's a long way from Nairobi travel across the country to an Arab northern little border town. If you leave early in the day, you'll still be on your way long after the sun is going down. It began as just a ride to the other side, but then was interrupted by the sound of the shattering of glass as the driver tried to pass the men with guns there on the dusty desert ground. There were two already dead, another shot as she fled. No question here whose lives were now at stake. When all is said and done, it is instances like this one, when every move is one that just might make or break. All passengers get out, men with guns began to shout, you Christians now get up against the wall. But then everyone stayed still, saying, now do as you will, you may leave, or you may kill us all. wasn't far away just over a year ago today when people were massacred exactly in this manner the pattern it was clear all the Muslims here would be safe if they just stood beside this banner 
headscarves passed from hand to hand among this human band live together or together fall and then nobody moved showing each of them approved of saying you may leave or you may kill us all wasn't set in stone there's no way they could have known that this time this act of solidarity would see the gunmen leave goals left unachieved on the border there in mandara county but sometimes you take a chance then at a second glance you see you've changed the world with the passing of a shawl there are those who will remember those who on one day in december said you may leave or you may kill us all you may leave or you may kill us all you may leave Of course, um, the most uh, compelling, perhaps, and most uh, clear and unequivocal form of solidarity that can possibly be offered uh, other than uh, actually somehow getting uh, directly Israel to lift the siege and stop the bombing. Um, is what Ansar Allah is doing, and uh, which is armed resistance against fascism, armed resistance against genocide, and um, and they are probably having more impact than anything anybody else is doing, and um, and that's not surprising. Half the world's trade passes by here So much of it goes through Tel Aviv Meanwhile in the port of Gaza No ships can arrive and not a boat can leave While every day hundreds are dying Beneath the rain of missiles fired from the air Millions of starving Palestinians on the run and being slaughtered everywhere no safe place in the gaza strip no armies coming to defend while all over the planet people are asking when will this savage bombing end how many more thousands of children can be killed while we stand by how can we just live our lives while we watch the babies die. Shukran Jazilan to the Houthi army standing for the conscience of us all. When they say no business as usual, while the bombs continue to fall. country that doesn't have an air force they're painted black red green and white on the helicopters they use to board the ships to show their cause is right the president says this terrorism must stop right away to which the Houthis respond, yes, that's exactly what we are trying to say. Shukran Jazilan to the Houthi army, standing for the conscience of us all. When they say no business as usual, while the bombs continue to fall. all the way around Africa to avoid the Houthi net. If Israel wants trading partners now, they might be just a little harder to get. We can blockade ports all over. 
north, south, east, and west. But the Houthi army are the ones who are no doubt blocking the traffic the best. Shukran Jazeelan to the Houthi army standing for the conscience of us all. When they say no business as usual, while the bombs continue to fall. It's, um, it is, uh, the, it is not a coincidence that we hear so much about uh, Ireland in the context of the protests against the genocide in Gaza, and um, it's um, it's uh, it's been happening for a very long time. Uh, this uh, this deep connection between uh, the Palestinian people and the Irish people. And um, specifically uh, in terms of uh, understanding and opposing uh, occupation of your land and people, um, the understanding of land and freedom and what it means um, in the context of being occupied. And um, it's, uh, there's so many parallels, uh, although certainly um, what is being done to Gaza is, uh, has few parallels in in uh in recent history the savagery and incredible amount of bombs being used and the the uh, totality of the famine uh, it's all very uh um nothing like what we've seen in this world uh for a very long time um despite the fact that there are other horrible things happening right now at the same time uh there's nothing quite like gaza and um and there hasn't been uh, for a very long time, <clears throat> but um, there are there are r lots of relevant parallels though, and um, and comparisons and and uh, you know similarities and and uh, one of the things that um, we hear a lot about uh, in uh, with Gaza and with uh, Israel and this conflict uh, of the. The Israeli military's conflict with the people of Gaza, which is what we're talking about here. What's that's what we're looking at when they call it a when the media calls this a war between Israel and Hamas. What they're doing uh, is engaging in Holocaust denial, and I think it's a very important uh, point to make. Uh, this is this is a form of Holocaust denial to call to call this uh, war a war between Israel and Hamas is a form of Holocaust denial. It's not a war between Israel and Hamas. It's obvious to anybody uh, who's been looking at what's been happening there for the past several months. This is a war of Israeli military against the people of Gaza. Uh, it is a war against the people in response to a people's war. It's the same kind of tactic that the U.S. used in Vietnam against the Vietnamese people, just killing them, um, you know, for existing. This is what's happening. Uh, it's a genocide. Uh, to 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 not acknowledge that is to deny a genocide. It is a form of Holocaust denial. Uh, that's what's going on. That's what we're seeing in the Western media is Holocaust denial every day. And uh, that's what we're seeing from the Western leaders is Holocaust denial, including many of the ones calling for a ceasefire who are not uh, calling this uh, Holocaust or calling it a genocide or calling it what it is, which is uh, Israel engaging in the mass starvation intentionally and completely unnecessarily of, of an entire population, mostly children. And, um, but, um, uh, you know, the Irish people refer to the Holocaust of the 1840s, um, which, which was in, in so many similar ways an intentional intentional killing of millions of people, intentionally not saving the lives of millions of people because your government changed its policy. I mean, it's as clear as night and day for those who aren't familiar with the history. Um, there was a government, it, right in the middle of, of the uh, potato blight, uh, there was a, 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 an election in England and a different party came to power and, and the, the, the uh, party that came to power in the middle of the, of the potato blight uh, no longer believed in keeping the Irish people alive. And uh, and so they uh, just you know stopped uh, you know um, 
they stopped with the arrangements that had existed prior to that, which I don't need to get into the details, but <clears throat> it was a government change and, and, and change in policy that directly resulted in the famine. Um, but uh, more recently than the Irish famine, um, w w you know, looking at the uh, the 1970s, um, you know, when, when we talk about these prisoners and hostages in Gaza and Israel, you know, thousands and thousands of, of, uh, of children being held in, in uh, Israeli prisons indefinitely without charge, uh, along with adults. Um, <clears throat> this this uh, whole thing of, like, I mean, you know, the, the difference, whatever the difference is supposed to be between a hostage and a prisoner, I mean, it is uh, completely uh, superficial. There is no difference. Uh, the way Israel takes prisoners, there's no difference. Uh, uh, they are just randomly selected. Uh, and, uh, you know, I mean, that is no exaggeration. They just randomly select people from the West Bank um, to imprison. Um, and, uh, and, and they hold them with no charges indefinitely, and they can renew their sentence every six months and just keep them there forever with no trial, no charges, nothing. That's exactly what, uh, that was the UK's policy in their occupation of Northern Ireland, of the occupied six counties of the north of Ireland. That was their policy, uh, indefinite detention without trial um, in the early 1970s, which is, you know, exactly what led to the uh, Republican movement getting bigger after that or during that time uh, was those kinds of repressive policies. Uh, if you're not going to kill everybody, which is clearly what the Israelis are attempting to do in Gaza right now, if you're not going to kill everybody, then um, you, um, you know, these kinds of repressive tactics tend to backfire. And I appreciate all those... Uh, slightly veiled uh, request for this song and um, it's always such a pleasure to see all you rebels from Ireland um, uh, on the feed there commenting this is for Commandante Francis Hughes he grew up on a farm in a troubled Irish land under foreign rule and the British crown's command. His father fought for Ireland 50 years before, but the free state cut their losses and the English won the war. When internment without trial was the order of the day, when his brother was arrested and his friends were blown away. When he was beaten near to death, he decided, come what may, he'd throw his lot in with the provost and he joined the IRA. In the occupied six counties, perhaps it never will be known. All the foreign soldiers in Armand and Tyrone who decided to head back across the Irish Sea so they wouldn't have to meet the man from south of Derry. He never wavered in his battle for Irish liberty, and the crown would soon regret the day they made him enemy. The Brits called it bandit country, and it filled them all with fright. In the borderlands, he who walked the hills at night. Up the provost, that's what he said. Three little words that filled the British crown with dread. With a rifle on his shoulder, a timer and a fuse. Long may we remember Commandante Francis Hughes. Long may we remember Commandante Francis Hughes. Once he was surrounded by the SAS, how he might escape was anybody's guess. In his boots and camouflage, he didn't miss a beat. He walked right past the soldiers and out into the street. Once he came upon a checkpoint, the soldier didn't want to die. He recognized our Francis, and the soldier waved him by. He didn't want to find out if he could take what he could give. He knew there'd be a shootout, and the soldier chose to live. Up the provost, that's what he said. Three little words that filled the British crown with dread. With a rifle on his shoulder, a timer and a fuse. Long may 
we remember Commandante Francis Hughes. Long may we remember Commandante Francis Hughes. He was the North's most wanted man with his photo everywhere. But he eluded capture with his wit and dyed blonde hair. For six years he was active three times as long as most. He became a legend north to south and coast to coast. He came upon two soldiers out one night on patrol. They shot him in the firefight and the bullets took their toll. He crawled off into the bushes but they found him the next day. Grabbed him by the arms and carried him away. Up the provost, that's what he said. With a shattered bone and a body full of lead. With a rifle and a timer and a fuse. Long may we remember Commandante Francis Hughes. Long may we remember Commandante Francis Hughes. tortured him and they gave him 80 years. When they brought him to the H blocks, he was greeted there with cheers. He went right on to the blanket and when the hunger strike began, he was the first to volunteer along with Bobby Sands. He was an Irish soldier and that's how he did his time. He knew he was no criminal and when occupation was the crime. Bobby Sands had passed beyond us where Francis soon would be and although he couldn't stand and he could barely see. Up the provost, that's what he said, as they carried him to hospital to lay in his deathbed with a rifle on his shoulder, a timer and a fuse. Long may we remember Commandante Francis Hughes. Up the provost, that's what he said. Three little words that filled the British crown with dread With a rifle on his shoulder, a timer and a fuse Long may we remember Commandante Francis Hughes Long may we remember Commandante Francis Hughes Somebody is asking about uh, me coming to New York City. I could and I might. Uh, there might be a gig in New York City on Friday. That is uncertain at this point. Um, but where I definitely will be playing is uh, Boston and Amherst, Massachusetts, New Haven, Connecticut, and Woodstock, New York. Um, so if you are in or near any of those places or know anyone who is, please send them to davidrovics.com slash tour, and they can find out about... Uh, and come to a gig and, you know, hopefully enjoy it. Um, and um, these are songs about resistance if, of one form or another, rather than just songs where everybody dies at the end, which is my specialty. But I was realizing today, uh, looking at these, uh, finding songs that were specifically about uh, resistance uh, that has actually had a positive impact um, in my humble opinion and I realized I've written a lot of these songs on that subject and you have just heard a selection of them and I will be doing many more of these uh, seg of these um, concerts on the internet specifically about songs of and about resistance um the up the rebels up the what am i calling it yeah up the rebels uh series there will be more i don't know when but soon and i will uh leave you with a song that isn't specifically actually about uh a specific resistance campaign it's more about the concept that music has an impact on fomenting and sustaining um, and uh, commemorating um, and inspiring resistance. 
um, the Israelis are very familiar with that um, concept of of music and art and culture um, inspiring resistance, which is exactly why they are destroying all the cultural institutions of Gaza one by at a time. They've destroyed hundreds of UN schools, uh, hundreds of hospitals and museums and other cultural uh, artifacts and statues. They're just destroying it all because they want to erase the existence of the Palestinian people. And partly a big part of why how you do that is by destroying cultural institutions and by assassinating journalists and assassinating artists and assassinating poets. And um, this is something they've been specifically doing for the past few months. I've also written songs about it. Um, but, uh, and if you want to hear those songs, davidrovics.com slash Palestine, you can hear them, uh, the songs about targeting journalists and all this uh, that I've written about. Um, but, um, the, and Israel has been doing that for a long time. Israel um, famously killed some of the most uh, beloved uh, Palestinian writers and, and journalists and artists in the 1970s in a campaign of assassinations. It's the same thing that Germany did in Poland when they were trying to erase uh, the Polish identity uh, when Germany invaded Poland in 1939. And it's the same thing that has been done to the indigenous peoples of uh, the United States, Canada, Australia, you know, in the residential schools or the Indian schools, depending on what country they're called, different things. But those uh, institutions were designed to do exactly the same thing, along with, of course, genocide before that of killing people in huge numbers, but the survivors who were sent to residential schools, um, very much like the, you know, uh, what they call the Israeli Arabs in a way. But um, but uh, Israel knows about the power of art and culture, and um, <clears throat> which is one of the things that inspires me to keep on writing these songs, because, you know, uh, not that I want to be assassinated, but uh, you know, I know it makes a difference, and it's it's sort of uh, helpful to see that the trolls and UK lawyers for Israel and all these groups that are sicking their trolls on me, and um, you know, trying to ruin my career, um, that they know they know how powerful music is, and uh, I can only hope to uh, reach a, l a wider audience, and um, and so that they can get even more upset. Um, but um, this is a song about the concept of music and and, and um, as a as a tool <coughs> for resistance um, rather than a song about a resistance activity of specifically other than well, I guess it is it's a song about music as a resistance activity but m the other songs in this series I promise will will stick to specific stories as I have done up until this <laughs> point in this set and the next uh, one that I do whenever that will be will be also specific stories of resistance. If a song could bring us together across the planet that gave us birth to act as one bring peace and justice all around this shattered earth if a song could take down borders take down fences make them fall liberate all those in prison kept behind the ghetto walls if a song could stop the bombs so the next might be the last if a song could change the future so it won't be like the past if a song could be a missile fired from the iron dome if it could protect the children keep them safe in their homes if a song could raise an army and transport it on command take us all to Palestine to defend the holy land if a song could be concrete and put to use to rebuild 
If it might turn back the clock, bring back all the babies killed. If a song could be a blueprint, instructions to show us how. If a song could change the world, then let us sing it now. If a song could bring us together across the planet that gave us birth to act as one, bring peace and justice all around this shattered earth. Thank you very much, everyone, for listening. And uh, this will be uh, archived on the very the usual platforms on YouTube, Facebook, X, um, afterwards, and in podcast form. You can find it on uh, Substack and Patreon and at davidrovics.com slash this week. Very soon, I'll put it up as a podcast. It'll also be on SoundCloud and various other places. Uh, if you look for This Week with David Rovix, wherever you get your podcasts, you can find it wherever you get your podcasts. Um, pretty much most of the platforms, you can get it there. Um, and, um, and if you are in the Northeast U.S. or um, th th coming right up, I'll be, I'll be playing in, um, in Boston, in Amherst, in New Haven, and in Woodstock. Um, and I would love to see people out there if in the Northeast if you know anyone ar around there. And if you are in other parts of the world and might have any inclination to hear music like this live and organize a gig uh, for me, that's how I actually do this. Um, it's all crowdfunded and crowdsourced. The gigs are crowdsourced and my survival is crowdfunded. Um, Patreon and Substack is where you can crowdfund my survival and allow me to keep on doing this. If you want to, and um, and the other thing you can do if you are inspired is to organize a gig. Um, so other than the Northeast coming right up, I will be uh, in uh, on the West Coast in Oregon uh, um, in doing gigs in late May. I'll be uh, doing a tour in Australia in June and July, and um, California West Coast tour in August, and in November Scandinavia. And then a year from this month in March uh, 2025, I'll be in England and hopefully also various other parts of the islands around there like Ireland and Scotland, etc. Thanks for listening and uh, keep on keeping on. Um, and um, yeah, free Palestine. Bye for now. <laughs>